will hopefully open up a few more areas which we can look at for appropriate pitches. But we must also, I believe, enforce against the illegal, or I use the word illegal, uh, um, unauthorised pitches as well that are popping up around our district. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Cargill. Councillor Jurid. Uh, mine was to report from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee who asked that um, they did not want to delay um, the adoption of the SPD, but they had there was a specific request from them uh, to review how the SPD was working in practice and also the liaison with the County Council, how that was working in practice. So at an appropriate time, we would like to make sure uh, uh, that, that this SPD is doing the, the job that it was intended to do. Thank you, Councillor Junard. I'm sure Councillor Pemberton will take those points on board. Um, sorry. That's all right. Thank you, Leader, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, can I just say to Councillor Pemberton, this is a very, very welcome document. Um, I know it's taken a little while to come forward, but I think it's, you know, it, now that it's arrived, it's, you know, we're all happy with it. We've had to make the necessary adjustments. And if I can just pick up on Councillor Cargill's particular point as the portfolio holder for enforcement, I do wish to reassure cabinet members that um, whilst we have slightly changed the um, proposals around the local enforcement plan, I can assure Councillor Cargill that we would be taking a very much robust view with regard to unauthorised sites. Um, and I'm delighted to say that whilst we paid farewell to Ron Goodyear, who's been um, an enforcement uh, officer with us for 17 years, we have actually welcomed a new member to the enforcement team who's joined us from Warwick District Council, Reginda, who is extremely experienced so that we have um, reinforced our enforcement team. So your points are well made, Councillor Cargill, but we will be taking a robust approach to unauthorised sites. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that reassurance, Councillor Parry. So the recommendation is on page 17. Uh, <clears throat> so. Our council, oh, sorry, our cabinet happy with the recommendation. Thank you, members of cabinet. Moving on, item six, draft sustainable homes, sustainable communities, housing strategy for Stratford-on-Avon district 2021 to 2026. Councillor Barker. I'll make this one short and sweet as well. Um, we're proposing that we adopt the draft sustainable homes, etc. strategy. Um, and that this recommendation goes to Council. Um, put plainly, the most important reason that it has to be adopted is that we have statutory and regulatory housing obligations that have to be undertaken and that this wraps them up completely. Um, you will notice, I'm just heading to the action plan. The action plan is live and we are looking to, as you will, as you will see in uh, I think 4.4 4 and 4.5 that this will be we will be um, probably making changes what those changes are, are up for discussion because of our closer and closer working with Warwick so the aims remain the same of supporting communities and building sustainable affordable homes improving existing housing and helping people to live independently and preventing homelessness and reduce the harm caused by it um, if anybody's got any questions about it, please do ask. But otherwise, I would ask that Cabinet endorses this strategy for adoption. Thank you, Councillor Harvey and then Councillor Junid. Thank you, Leader. <clears throat> um, we did have a preliminary discussion about this paper. In fact, we had several discussions about this paper, but I would like to compliment the officers on the inclusion at, uh, at a request of Appendix A, which gave some contextual numbers um, to, the, to the, the issue of housing. And I have to say that the most striking pair of numbers that took my eye in that appendix was the information that the median income in the district is £28,004. 
And this is insufficient to afford in the private sector to rent a one bedroom flat where you would need an income of 31,200. That to me says quite a lot. It tells me that we have two responsibilities. One is to encourage the economy within the district in order that median salaries rise. And secondly, to act on the, on the provision of affordable housing, because if somebody on average earnings can't afford a one bedroom flat in this district, that to me is a, is a, a sure sign that we have a, a significant problem. So I welcome the information provided by the, by the officers through that, that appendix. There's one other substantive point I'd like to make, which is that the paper talks about um, regular reviews uh, to cabinet every six months. Uh, I welcome that. I would like to know which months, not now, but I'd like to, I'd like to have stakes in the ground so that I know every six months that we're going to have a chance to review progress. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't need a lengthy document to review. What I need in reference to page 42 is the paragraph which talks about facts. I would like the six monthly report to provide data about homelessness and progress, the state of the housing waiting list, uh, the need, the demand for affordable houses, uh, the number who are living in poor quality homes, the number living in fuel poverty, and the number, number of empty houses in the district. If we have information, if we have data on those six items, we are in a good position to say where our resources are best placed to best effect. So I commend that to the officers. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Harvey. Uh, Councillor Barker, do you wish to respond to that? I, and then I'll bring in Councillor Dunard. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Councillor Harvey for picking out what I, I agree is the singularly most important thing that we have a real gap between income and affordability of housing. And that is the main thing that we need to address, whether it is via the housing company and working together with them, whether it is with charities, as we have done in some places, uh, whether it is buying stock. And um, one of the things that we are talking about is micro homes um, so that what you're actually offering, whether it's for sale or for rent, much smaller so that people can actually live sing as single people, because that is you know, almost impossible at the moment and is stopping people from moving, not just physically, but moving um, up and upwards and onwards. And so uh, that, that's what we I, I guess we, we really need to see that social mobility. Councillor Junard. Yes, it was a specific request made at the Overview and Scrutiny Committee um, by myself to ask that we do uh, seek um, data. I, I did ask originally for a task and finish group from Overview and Scrutiny that would look at all the housing waiting lists, the, exactly the, the, the questions. It could be done that way or it could be, and, and I did talk to the chair, done through the uh, Overview and Scrutiny Committee more generally as a review. But we do need to make sure that um, the, this document is, is delivering. Uh, and just um, on, I, I certainly know in Ulster that there are lots of people who are in, in work who cannot afford uh, to buy houses and there is there is there are problems but a couple of questions if I might um, we have apparently got as of April 2021 2.8 million in a pot that is uncommitted uncomm uh, when the council receives money in lieu of on-site provision of affordable homes I'm just wondering whether that is um, li likely to be considered by uh, the housing company as, as uh, a bill to rent as a possible way forward and then there is uh, uh, some uh, da data here about mandatory licensable homes in multiple occupation in the district. Apparently there are 250 of which 61 have been licensed. What are the implications to the council if the others are not licensed uh, or the council is not seen as taking action? What is the position on that? Uh, and then I wondered also whether uh, we could look at the fuel poverty. We've got 7,559 7, households who are fuel poor uh, and how we're addressing that. And then more generally, um, 
is it possible to produce data on specific wards or would that be um, too difficult to do? But it, it would be useful to know which wards and which areas have actually got the particular problems, uh, either of um, a housing waiting lists, a lack of affordable homes, um, fuel poverty, uh, just so that we can, as councillors, get to grips more with the data for our own own um, own areas. Uh, finally, the housing waiting list, we start from a position of 5,131 households on the list in November 2020. I really want to be able to see, uh, a, a, you know, some progress in that. And that's one of the reasons why I specifically wanted uh, some report to the Ovian Scrutiny Committee at an appropriate time to make sure that we are scrutinising and making sure that uh, things are being delivered for, for the people of this area. Thank you. Councillor Barker, do you wish to respond? I and do. Then Councillor you. Pemberton. Um, there is coming along the track a root and branch look at everything we do to do with housing, particularly with the housing waiting list. I can't preempt what is actually going to happen, but I can tell you that in, uh, in Warwick District, um, a rather more radical approach was taken to the waiting list. And I would say that uh, we will be stopping people from applying at birth just in case they need a house to retire into, which is sometimes what our housing waiting list does feel like. I kid you not. Um, <clears throat> it's because it's it's it, the churn is not it's not and I'm making a point, but that's what that that is certainly um, one of the issues. The other issue is what we um, what we actually end up building in terms of uh, affordability as well. In terms of um, overview and scrutiny needing a task and finish group, I think that potentially I, I would resist that from the point of view that we actually need to do the work first. Um, and there's quite a lot of work going on um, with housing, particularly as there's been you know, some huge changes. The head of housing is somebody who is over on the Warwick side at the moment. So we're you know, forming those relationships and getting the plans together. And actually, it's a really, really exciting time. So there's loads going on. And you can scrutinise that as much as you like, but we are doing stuff. That's the difference. Thank you, Councillor Barker, Councillor Pemberton, then Councillor Parry, then Councillor O'Donnell. Thank you, Leader. Um, it was very much along, along the same lines in the sense that if what I heard was correct, that we're going to have a set of data points reported on each six months, which are on all fours with the data points, as far as I can see, that the overview and scrutiny committee were interested in. I suppose the question then is, do we actually need to duplicate that work? If those data points are available to cabinet, they're available to the overview and scrutiny committee, and that should then generate where are we with actions rather than a task and finish script? So I, I would merely just suggest that we think about how we approach that, because if we're putting, if we're, if we're making the data or if our officers are making the data available, which would be the, in essence the same data that appears to be the sort of subject of a task and finish group, let's let's be smart about it. Let's measure, let's take the data and then measure the progress and then evaluate through the scrutiny process whether that progress is in line with our 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 expectations or not and and running alongside that if we're actually as councillor barker has indicated looking to have a fundamental reset for the housing team that would that those discussions are, I, I, again it, it just seems there may be a bit of sort of it might be just a bit early and I, and I also look at the, t at the two of you and thinking to, you, to myself you've got an awful lot on your plate and perhaps this is more of a forward work program when we've got a f at least to the point when we've got the first set of data numbers off, off the back of that would be my observation that we then sort of get to a point where we, we hit we hit it once and hit it together. Thank you Councillor Pemberton. Councillor Parry. Thank you, Leader. I just really wanted to make an observation as someone who has worked in the professional lettings industry for the last seven years until the end of June, where we um, test uh, potential tenants affordability 
um, and then take them through a referencing agency, which is governed by very specific criteria. And the um, matrix for calculating that is that you take the thousands, in other words, say it was 28,000, you times it by 30. That gives a rent, an affordability rent of up to 840 per month. Um, so, and that is um, professional guidance in the lettings business. Um, so therefore someone being able to afford um, 720 pounds per month would need to be on a salary of 24. Between 23 and 24 would take us up to that 700 pounds per month. I just wanted to make that observation from a lettings professional perspective. Thank you, Councillor Parry. Councillor O'Donnell. Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, it's just for clarification. Um, I know that Councillor June and I have spoken about a task and finish group, but I felt having discussed it with um, Mr Weeks and I discussed it with yourself, Councillor Pemberton, that actually a session at scrutiny with portfolio holders and officers and an update will be far more useful to us and a more useful t resource both time-wise and, and body-wise, as it were. So we were looking for regular updates because it is, as Councillor Barker um, indicated a really exciting time moving forward um, and also just thinking about housing I'm not sure if this is the moment to bring it in we were talking about um, sustainable housing and fitting in with our green agenda and did actually ask if we could get Councillor Shenton in to let us know just how rigid restrictions are regarding the green agenda um, and whether building regs and national policy is perhaps hindering us in any way because we need some stronger guidance because I know that you're very committed and very realistic with where you think we're at with the green agenda and our targets. So that was that was one of the offshoots that came out of the discussion around the housing document as well. So really it was more for attending OSC rather than the task and finish group, which I think would be far more useful for us. Thank you. Can, I just, confirm, can I just confirm that that was the conversation I had with uh, Councillor O'Donnell? Thank you, Councillor Junid. Councillor Kettle. I'm very happy, very happy to comment. I'm not sure whether this is public because I did only come back yesterday, so I'm not going to tell you how many unless someone nods at me and says I can. Um, but yeah, the conversations were had while I was on holiday because some things I was prepared to talk about and Afghan refugees was certainly one of them. Um, and we are getting, I think it would be fair to say, considerably more than perhaps we might have thought of at the beginning. Um, Lisa Barker has done a really good job negotiating it both for how many come in to Warwick District and how many come into Stratford District and how they're housed um, and I will be keeping a close eye on it. In fact we've already had before this tranche we'd already got Af Afghan refugees coming um, and I have an arrangement to go and visit a, a family if they agree to see me um, to just personally find out their story and understand a bit more about it so yeah top of my absolutely top of my pile and we will do everything we can there are also many many people locally you will have seen this on the Stratford forum and on others um, who are dying to give stuff um, and I had another offer from a church today which was a wasn't just giving stuff it was you give us a list of what you actually want and we'll get it um, so there's quite a lot of uh, goodwill out there that we can harness Thank you, Thank you, Councillor Barker, and I would just say that I thought Councillor Kettle's points on the Afghan refugees were extremely well made. So with that, the recommendation to Council is on page 41. Uh, do I have your agreement to the recommendation to Council members of Cabinet? 
Thank you, members of cabinet. So moving on, uh, capital budget monitoring, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Leader. The purpose of this paper is to keep members informed of the progress made over the first four months of the year in undertaking the Council's intended level of capital expenditure this year. Table 2 on page 88 demonstrates the intention to undertake expenditure of £13.9 million this year, including Section 106 projects. Taking into account the additional funds of £2.9 million budgeted for this year, this will result in the balance of the Council's accumulated capital receipts and grants being reduced over the year, assuming all capital projects budgeted were to be delivered, as reported on tab in Table 1 on page 87, from £5.7 million to £4.4 million. Paragraph 1.5 indicates that capital expenditure of £1.9 million has already been undertaken by the end of July. In the first four months of the year, therefore, the sums spent or committed amount to 14% of this year's available budget of £13.9 million. Appendix 2 on pages 95 to 99 provides summary information concerning the various projects yet to be funded through Section 106 agreements. Of the grand total of £4.5 million reported on page 98, some £3.6 million relates to funds identified for the provision of affordable housing. The paper also sets out the capital expenditure implications of the arrangements entered into with SLM for the management of the district's leisure services provision. The contract provides for the Council to advance up to £4 million for investment in facilities, with just over £3 million of this amount to be advanced over the first 12 months of the contract from July 2021. This will be financed initially from the Council's own balances, supplemented by borrowing from the Public Works Loan Board as and when required. Turning to the implications of the refuse collection contract that is currently the subject of a tendering process, it's intended that the Council will fund the acquisition of refuse vehicles required to fulfil this contract involving an investment of £4.5 million. The cost of this element of the intended programme will be reflected in the terms of the contract. The new contract will also involve a requirement for the provision of a food caddy to all households at an estimated cost of up to £0.45 million. This sum represents Stratford's funding requirements for the vehicles. The Council is currently taking advice on the best structure for the financing of all the new vehicles and will require either Stratford or Warwick to fund the full fleet and recharge the other authority for the, the financing costs. If Stratford is the lead authority, the total capital expenditure will be in the region of £9.5 million. The extra capital charges would be, would be recharged to the other authority, to Warwick, making this revenue neutral for the lead authority, Stratford. Again, the final decision for this should be delegated to the Head of Finances in consultation with the portfolio holder for resources. I ask the Leader, therefore, first, that the current position on capital expenditure and income for the period to the end of July 2021 be received, and second, that the terms of the second recommendation in relation to the requirement for capital expenditure in relation to the contract with SML and in relation to the refuse contract, currently the subject of a tendering process, as set out on page 87, be agreed. The figure for potential investment should be increased to £9 million to reflect the potential for, the, for SDC to be the lead authority for the acquisition of the vehicles, with the final decision delegated to the Head of Finances in consultation with the whole policy of Beg your pardon, in consultation with the portfolio holder for resources. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, uh, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Junid. Uh, yes, I was I was surprised at the uh, the cost of the uh, food caddies, although I, I support the idea of, of, of collecting food separately, but I, I was surprised at uh, 0.45 million 
Um, but I just wondered whether there would be any government grant um, to support this, because I understand that uh, the, the waste strategy, the government waste strategy, certainly the original government waste strategy, I'm not sure we've had the updated one yet, uh, was certainly indicating that it was going to be a requirement from government and therefore I would have, uh, I would have hoped and supposed that they would then consider uh, helping with the, the cost of it. Mr. Buckland, do you wish to respond? I, I, and be, before I before I finished, could I also confirm uh, that the, the the play area that is listed in here, uh, Hopkins Precinct, is commencing the week beginning the 13th of September to be finished by the 8th of October. And thank you to all officers concerned. Thank you, Mr. Buckland, and then Councillor Pemberton. Thank you, Chairman. And if they've already got funding from government, we'd absolutely take advantage of that first, Councillor Chair. Unfortunately, until it is a new burden, we haven't had the new burdens funding that, that would come with that. And therefore, at this stage, it would be prudent to, to budget for those additional costs of 450,000 for property, about 60,000 properties across the district. It, it doesn't seem that bad for, for, from my, my historic view as a, 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 an accountant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buckland. Councillor Pemberton. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say at, at 60,000 properties um, with probably two, maybe three food caddies, it's probably in the three quid a pot. So I wouldn't have said I wouldn't have said 450k was that far out, actually. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'll probably just re reinforce that. I was just trying to do the mental maths. Thank you. We're all accountants now, you. Leader. Uh, I'm sure Councillor Shenton has now done the maths. <laughs> Can, can you use your microphone, please, Councillor Shenton? OK, so I see no further uh, indications that people want to comment. So the recommendations on page 87, can I have a proposer and a seconder for those, please? Councillor Harvey and yes, Councillor Jennings. Sorry. Chair, Chair, can I just clarify whether there are other recommendations other than in the written report itself? I, I thought I heard some question about a delegation of power to somebody. The intention is that the recommendation is for up to £9 million to uh, include both refuse and the lending for the uh, leisure centre finance. Uh, to be delegated to head of finance in consultation with. Are you saying the recommendations that need to be changed, Mr. Grafton? All I was clarifying was that there's some recommendations in the written report, but there's another recommendation that isn't is not in the report itself, from what I've seen. Is it, or am I? No, have no. I skipped it? No, the recommendation Okay, so so there's some recommendations in the report plus the one that um, Councillor um, Councillor Harvey has just mentioned. Have we captured that? We, we, we got that. Yeah. Fine. Thank I'm, you. I'm leader. I'm clear. Right. Uh, in that case, it being proposed and seconded, uh, are cabinet members in support of the recommendations? Brilliant. Thank you. So moving on, shared legal services for Stratford on Avon and Warwick District Council. Evidently, the portfolio holder for this is me. Uh, this is a proposal that we create a shared service for legal services for Warwick and Stratford districts. At the moment, obviously, Stratford on Avon District has its own legal services team. Uh, Warwick District relies on Warwickshire County Council for their legal services. The intention is that we create a single legal services. That means we will recruit people to staff up a legal services team to replace the resources that they currently um, commissioned from Warwickshire County Council. 
what you will notice is that the savings are quite significant in terms of this. Um, I think, speaking from memory, uh, the total savings are 148,000. Uh, not only that, it will give us far greater resilience in terms of the service provided, far better cover and a service far more tailored to the needs of the district councils. Um, frankly, I, I see no reason not to accept the recommendation on page 101. Uh, does anyone have any comments, please? Councillor Kettle. Um, Mr. Grafton, thank you. Um, are there any areas um, where Warwickshire County Council or, or Warwickshire Legal Services um, have an area of expertise that would be challenging to buy to, for us to build in house? Um, and if there are those areas, would we seek to go back to WLS or would we seek to buy those in from the third third party? Mr. Grafton. Are good vice speakers working? So that's a good question. And um, indeed, there is one particular area, and that's employment law and uh, advice and assistance. So we did a cost analysis on that, compared the current service that both councils are getting from the county council. Because in fact, although it's right that we do provide at Stratford an in house service, the one area that we don't cover for Stratford is employment law so so our hr staff at stratford have for the last few years received a service directly from the county as well uh, and we just thought it, it, it that the figures didn't stack up so the intention is subject to further further discussion with the county that the county would continue to provide an employment related service for both us and warwick district council for the current time um, over and above that um, obviously, because of the size of um, Warwickshire Legal Services, they've got a lot more reach in terms of expertise, um, in terms of things that we wouldn't routinely do um, more on the commercial and development side. Uh, so we have options there, really. It's always been the case that where, wherever you've got an in-house legal service, it, it's not necessarily the case that you get every bit of legal advice from the in-house legal team simply because sometimes there isn't the capacity or there isn't the expertise and, and that's of no um, no negative comments about the, the district council team at all. So we have options in terms of resourcing for the unusual uh, and the very complex and and let's face it that that could that could involve the county council but there are a whole load of other providers out there and we do have the advantage of having a, a framework agreement called the east midlands law share framework agreement where we get preferential rates from um, big uh, international and national legal firms um, so there are a number of options but to, in short yes there will be the employment uh, law that the county will continue to provide for us and there may be other opportunities for the county and for other providers, but that's no change from any other legal service in, in house. I would just echo that, Mr. Grafton, that we already go outside for our legal advice in specialist circumstances or specialist issues. You wish to come back, Councillor Kent? Yeah, I was just going to say so. In fact, um, in the event that we were unable to come to a framework agreement with WCC on that, there, there, there is uh, easily accessible resource outside the market, which would be able to fill that hole Absolutely. at a reasonable cost. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just a quick question, actually, um, Mr. Grafton, leading on from Councillor Kettle's question. I look at um, risk assessment and on the second point, um, or the first point, actually, 5.1, that you may not be at full capacity, but you feel by having a long enough run in time that will give you a get out of jail card, as it were, no pun intended. Um, how far down the line, how much buffer is there before you would actually hit the panic button that we're not going to be fully recruited? And what's the recruitment market like? And if you weren't recruited, fully recruited, would it be cost effective to be outsourcing continually until you get fully staffed? So again, that's a very good point. Um, it's the mind the gap period, I suppose, if, if this proposal is approved here today. 
um, because of course we will start the recruitment process um, but it, it's also true to say that there are a number of risks along the way between now and the end of next March. One of them, and perhaps the main one, is recruitment. We've been working very closely at officer level with the County Council and indeed uh, Warwick District Council, um, hence Andrew is here, um, uh, for, for many months. And, and we, we both are working together and recognise that neither, none of the councils involved want to have that, or want to mitigate that event, but, but there will be contingency plans in place so that if necessary, some of the work that the, the county are currently doing, particularly if they're projects, will they'll finish, e even though it might be after March next year. And we also have an understanding with the county that if there is the problem with recruitment, then they will continue to provide us with a, a service in the short term. Thank you, Mr Grafton. I think it is fairly clear that whatever the gap may be, uh, there are processes in place to manage that. And I think it is worth remarking that the potential savings on this run to 148,000 a year, which is not an insignificant sum in the context. So, just one last one. Is there a risk that this um, change in arrangements would get caught up in TUPI? Uh, yes, uh, in fact, that's um, that's a central part of the report because, yes. of course, um, it, 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 these are contractual issues, really. So that the arrangement that Warwick have got with the county at the moment is is a contract. Obviously, the arrangement going forward will also be a contractual situation. And when you've got service provider changes, two P arises, and we've we've had discussions with the county. There are up to four staff affected. Um, obviously. Um, we, we don't know at the moment whether those four staff or any of them will. Did we get into 2PN staff and well, stuff? I was just. Well, it's in the. Oh, sorry. I was it's just... it's in the report. Okay. And um, we, we're not talking. We're not talking about individuals here because Thank there you. are there are over nearly 90 staff yeah. in uh, the, the 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 legal team. So I'm I'm not talking out of term here. Um, and um, but but of course that's got to play through in. In its, uh, through its own process between those staff and the County Council. But yeah, that, that could be a factor that we receive one, two, three, or even four staff from the County Council, but there will still be a recruitment process to go through because we, we need to recruit eight in total. To, to be fair, Councillor Kettle, a lot of that was covered in the paper. Yeah, Mr. Carter, put more meat on that particular vote. Thank you. So are there any further questions or comments, member of members of cabinet? So I propose that we accept the recommendation on page 101. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Pem. Uh, all those in favour? I take that as unanimous. Thank you, members of cabinet. So we move on to item nine on the agenda. Strategic Housing Land Availability Assessment Update, Councillor Pemberton. Thank you, Leader. Um, the purpose of this paper before you, Cabinet, uh, is for seeking a recommendation that the Strategic Housing Land Availability Assessment, known, uh, it trips off the tongue as the SHLA, uh, the update for 2021 um, is endorsed and published in order to inform our plan making process. By way of background, uh, I would draw members' uh, attention to paragraph 1.2, which confirms that there is a requirement under the National Planning Policy Framework for us to maintain an up-to-date evidence base through the use of a SHLA, uh, and, and this, uh, this is the, the update. Uh, I would also draw members' attention to paragraphs 1.4 on page 131 and 1.5, particularly on page 132, which set the context for the SLA, I think, uh, 1.5. In short, the SLA is not about whether a site could be developed. Um, it is about whether a site could be developed, not whether it should be developed. So it's actually a sifting mechanism. Uh, we have to update it. Um, and uh, members, um, I, I really think that uh, we should just then move to the recommendation as the uh, as we have to have uh, an updated SLA to inform the site allocations plan. Thank you. Any questions or comments from members of cabinet? Councillor Kettle. Um, in the, clearly those who put forward these additional sites uh, wanted them included. 
um, and looking at one or two randomly, particularly those mentioned in my ward. The general uh, review is that they have not been included for the reasons set out in the report. Um, is that could that be subject to legal challenge from later to date? No. In the sense that we've got it right, that Phil will always tell me that anything can be subject to legal challenge, but we've got it right. So for the avoidance of doubt for all you landowners out there, we've got it right. Don't bother challenging us. Thank you for that very bullish statement, Councillor Pemberton. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Shenton. I'm expecting a, a, a similar kind of response now. I'm going to add to my question. Um, looking at the various maps and that on the chart, and I fully support the, 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 the chart, um, it appears that there are a lot of sites that are coming forward potentially um, or being offered radiate out from existing settlements. Are we seeing, in your view, are we going to see any change to that in that some sites may come forward on network routes or um, if you like, a, a more sustainable approach to it than just radiating out from villages. And I'm expecting a, quite a robust response from you on that. So. Councillor Pemberton, <laughs> do you wish to thank, respond? Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Shenton. I mean, the truth of the matter is that the Schla has to be seen in the context of the current core strategy, which, as we all know, has a dispersal strategy. So it's no great surprise that sites come forward uh, based on that current dispersal strategy. And of course, the site allocations plan is a creature of the current core strategy. Members will, of course, be aware that we are already underway embarking on a new South Warwickshire local plan, and I cannot prejudge the um, the outcome of the consultations. However, um, from my perspective, and if landowners are listening out there, um, Merely expanding the existing settlements with no infrastructure coming alongside that doesn't strike me as the most uh, most efficient plan that one could devise moving forward. Um, I would envisage that when we get to a schlab based around the New South Warwickshire plan, uh, that landowners will will see the direction of travel, pardon the pun, uh, and will be looking for appropriate to bring forward appropriate sites based on a new reality. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pemberton. Uh, do I have any more questions or comments? Uh, see no hands up. In that case, can I have a proposal for the recommendation on page 131? Councillor Pemberton and Councillor Cargill are seconded. Can I have your agreement then to the recommendation on page 131, please? I'll take that as unanimous. Thank you. Item 10. Allocate. <coughs> excuse me. Allocation of community infrastructure levy funds. Councillor Pemberton. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'm not sure. Do we have any speakers on this item? I, I did have an indication that potentially the chair of uh, Welford Parish Council wanted to speak on, on the matter. Has that? There were two. All right. OK, thank you. OK. OK, uh, I'll, I'll move on then. Uh, uh, members, um, the report before you makes a number of recommendations for the proposal of currently available SIL funds held by this council as at the 31st of March. Um, four particular projects have been identified for support, they being uh, the Greg Memorial Hall in Ulster, um, Napton Community uh, Electoral Vehicle Charging Points at the uh, Napton Village Hall, um, a sum to be allocated to the Meon Vale Pavilion Community Project, uh, and then that to leave a relatively small residual amount to be carried forward into 2023 uh, when further funds will come forward, which will enable um, us to uh, consider um, new projects. Um, I shall probably leave it just at that point. Um, and any questions or observations? Thank you, Councillor Pemberton, Councillor Cargill, and then Councillor Jimmy. Thank you, Leader. This has been a long journey for the Greg Hall. And I think we've all uh, got a t-shirt and a few scars along the way, including Mr. Buckland. I think we've, uh, we've seen that. Thank you very much indeed for this. Uh, it is very, very welcome. I should just say that uh, currently £90,000 have been committed to the refurbishment. Work has started on the roof. I should also, as I did declare an interest, I am the chair of the working group, hence I won't be voting on this particular item. 
but it is moving ahead and I'd like to thank the support uh, say thank you Stratford District Council for their support over the years in this it's going to be a fantastic community centre when it's done and I'm really looking forward to inviting you all to our first event on the 4th of December which is a, a fair just to say people Ken. were there Thank you, Councillor Cargill. I would just add that not only was the process long, it was also tortuous. Councillor Junid. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm the ward member um, that covers where the Greg Memorial Hall is situated. So I have declared that as an interest and support uh, the project. I'm also a member of the working group uh, as well. Uh, I just want to also um, just talk about some of the other items that are not being supported. I understand why. Uh, but do want to make keep it at your, the forefront of your mind. For example, that the flood management system, the impact of flooding in Ulster is quite considerable. I've kept all the records of various flooding events uh, since 1998 of the number of houses that are impacted. Uh, so I do hope that something can be done on that one because uh, it's uh, of the order of 120 houses that are impacted in the town every time it, it floods. Uh, so we, we do need to, the, uh, and on item 27, which also comes to, to Ulster, I'm just wondering whether there's any help that the District Council could give to help with other external grant funding, um, maybe to, to reach um, that. And finally, um, several of the items that are covered are village halls. I'm wondering whether these could become exemplars for energy efficiency measures to their local communities. And I'm wondering whether initial audits, which are the stumbling block in many cases to get going on um, applying for grants for energy efficiency measures and also renewable energy measures in village halls. Could those initial audits be considered as an item for the climate change fund? Um, and then on the understanding that they're paid back if the grant applications are successful and that they then become exemplars to the community. Uh, then then that they become exemplars to the community uh, open with uh, able to show people just what they could do in their own homes and that would um, would encourage more people to do the right thing on energy efficiency. I wonder if that if that could possibly be put forward and be considered please. Councillor Pemberton. Thank you, as uh, thank thank you, Councillor Junid. And as, as you highlight, there are there are always more projects than there are potentially still funds to support. Um, uh, and you will note that a number of projects uh, there are there are some there are some status updates on those projects. I think including the Ulster Flood Scheme uh, and and a new raft of projects to uh, to come alongside uh, for next year. Uh, Councillor Junid, you, you you rightly highlight that still funds cannot be used for the audit that you mentioned and I would I would suggest that this is something that Councillor Shenton will pick up through the climate change panel at the end of the day we have a uh, we have set aside funds to make a difference uh, uh, in relation to climate change um, and we will be asked serious questions if we fail to spend that money effectively I stress the word effectively and clearly if there is an opportunity to to pump prime action uh, and there's a the possibility of that being recycled back in um, so that then that money can then be deployed on actual change as opposed to audit uh, and I do understand that audit is a precursor then that seems to be um, an elegant solution for uh, use of climate change panel monies. Thank you Councillor Pemberton. Councillor Parry. Thank you leader. Um, I just wanted to obviously say um, I'm very much in support of the recommendations in front of us today but could I possibly ask um, that officers give a detailed response to those um, applications who've not been successful, explaining in detail why. Um, the reason behind that is obviously parish councils, town councils and various organisations go to a, a lot of effort from their perspective to submit um, the applications and I think it's very important that they have a clear understanding and response as to why their application in this instance was not successful um, as this would be very beneficial in them perhaps putting it forward 
on a on a future occasion. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Parry. I think that's a perfectly reasonable request. I think standard response back. I think also I would just point out that the sums at the moment in SIL are not huge. And there is no doubt about it that probably some of the submissions will actually succeed in future rounds. Councillor Shenton. Just a couple of quick uh, quick points. Uh, I'd agree with Councillor Pemberton. The, uh, the, the issue that uh, Councillor June had raises should be at tomorrow's um, climate change panel rather than here. Um, and secondly, I'd just say uh, uh, thank you for allocating funds to the Napton Community EV um, uh, project. Uh, from a climate change point of view, I would hope that more parish councils would do the same installing uh, EV points at their village halls. So hopefully this will be the start of something big. Thank you, Councillor Shenton. I think it would be, would be worthwhile actually monitoring how well the Napton community's uh, electric vehicle charging points go. Uh, one of the other points I would just make is that uh, the use of the funds on this allocation has been spread across the district, which I think is a, a very good message. Councillor Kettle. Um, it would be very helpful, uh, Mr Chairman, if ward members could be included in any responses to unsuccessful applicants um, and that we would have the opportunity of working with officers uh, if, if there are projects which have failed um, by, uh, under, under the mandatory uh, tests, if we could work together with officers and the communities to try and get those over the border, notwithstanding there is a, a finite amount of capital available for these. Um, but clearly, as Councillor Parry has said, a lot of people have put a lot of time effort getting these things in front of us. Um, and having made that investment, if we could at some point in the future push them over the boundary into a funded project as opposed to a failed project would be much appreciated. I, I think I would observe that's, a, that's something for members to be proactive about. Um, officers are dealing with a myriad of groups uh, and then to add another 36 stakeholders. I think you all know in your own wards where where things are coming forward and I think actually if you if you want to be part of that process I would I would request that you are proactive in so doing um, because they're not all parish council groups there are there are lots of different groups who may or may not uh, feel the benefit of uh, a ward members intervention so I think that would be for, for ward members to liaise with the particular groups concerned and be proactive about being part of that process uh, rather than uh, adding that and being prescriptive about it from a from an officer point of view, but uh, absolutely uh, officers will engage with all the appropriate stakeholders. I think you make a very valid point, Councillor Pemberton, especially when you see the amount of work that actually does go in to this. I mean, the amount of uh, work that officers have done uh, to me looks absolutely massive. Mr Buckland. Thank you, Absolutely right, and I do appreciate that, but thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Buckland. Uh, so, with that, the recommendations on page 155. Uh, Councillor Pemberton, are you proposing these? I am indeed, Leader. Councillor seconding. Therefore, can I have your agreement to the recommendations on page 155? I take that as unanimous. So, moving swiftly on, item 11, uh, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Leader. The purpose of this report is to inform the Cabinet of the revenue picture of the Council's finances to the end of July 2021. I'd like to begin uh, by asking members to turn to Appendix 3 on page 209. This shows that the net budget to be financed by the Council this year is £17.4 million. If we now turn to Appendix 
2 on page 207, we can see that the budget for the whole year is for the total expenditure of £27.2 million and total income from various sources of £11.8 million. The difference between these two numbers, together with the net cost of the benefits of £182,000, represents the total amount to be funded from various sources, i.e. that's £15.6 million as set out in the appendix. In addition, Appendix 2 also sets out that as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Council has received civil contingencies funding from the government of £13.4 million, of which £12.6 million has been distributed in ways consistent with the government's intentions, leaving a balance of, of £802,000 at the end of July. Turning to the position at the end of period four, we can see that in round terms, the Council's expenditure of £11.8 million was a million pounds more than budgeted. This reflects a variety of reasons set out in paragraph 5.1. The continuing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is similarly illustrated in the shortfall against budgeted income to the end of July of £1.4 million, principally due to shortfalls in revenue of £606,000 generated from fees and charges, most notably 441,000 of revenue lost from the district's car parks. The combination of these results means that the net cost of services provided in the first four months of the year was £5.7 million. Section three of the paper identifies the principal items of variance from their budgeted figures during the period April to July, notably off-street parking, having generated £441,000 less than had been budgeted, whilst the garden waste collection scheme has generated almost a million pounds, 979,000 more than had been budgeted. Section four provides estimates for the outturn for the year in full, a shortfall of almost a million pounds. You'll see that it is anticipated that the shortfall in revenue from off-street car parking will be similar at the end of the year as it was at the end of July. At the same time, it's anticipated the above budgeted income received from the garden waste collection scheme will potentially be offset somewhat by the impact, I'll choose those words carefully, uh, will potentially be offset somewhat by the impact of the consequences of the fire at the Eddington recycling plant. Section six of the paper demonstrates that the strain that the pandemic continues to have on the council's reserve position, which at this stage is estimated will be reduced by more than an, another £400,000 from 7.2 million to 6.8 million pounds. An outcome, note, an outcome that can only be achieved as a result of a transfer of 2.4 million pounds from the council's earmarked reserves. Appendix four identifies the council's current earmarked reserves, which stand at 13.6 million pounds if the 29.4 million reserve in relation to business rates is discounted on the basis that this sum appears as an earmarked reserve temporarily as a timing matter before it is allocated elsewhere within the council's accounts. Subject to any further information that Mr Snow, who is in on the meeting, might wish to provide and to any questions members may have, I ask that the report be received. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Pemberton and then Councillor Kettle. Thank you, Leader. Um, uh, Councillor Harvey, you, you, you highlight um, monies that are held, um, and it's 29.375 million uh, before they're distributed. Um, to what extent um, are we able to maximize any interest return or investment income on that sum of money if at all um, to ameliorate the uh, in some way the position that we find ourselves in um, if we're not allowed to do any of that then that's fair enough i hesitate to ask because that's a point of detail that uh, mr snow may comment upon but my understanding is that balances while they're held by the council wherever they come from are subject to our treasury management processes and therefore uh, they were managed on the basis that they'd be interest bearing if at all possible. 
Mr Snow may know different. Mr Snow, do you wish to come in, please? Uh, I can come in, thank you. No, uh, uh, Councillor Harvey is correct. I mean, it is just part of our balances. The government's uh, paid us this month this money uh, in the last financial year in respect of the extra business relief uh, business rate relief um, largely for the retail premises but also some of the other sort of selected premises and it's a peculiarity with the accounting for collection fund of business rates which nobody really wants to know the detail of if they um, want to get away from here tonight um, but effectively you know that balance is carried forward and it is uh, there is a contrary balance as well within the council's reserves on the on the collection fund which that will that will have to fund in this current year but it is a, you know it is just an accounting issue really as to why it's showing as a has to be shown as a within our reserves there in short no real opportunity to uh, to make a turn on that no it's no. sorry can i just clarify that i thought what you said mr harvey was that that just goes into a pot that is uh, that is managed by our treasury function. What we cannot spend it other than for the purpose for which it it was received. Having said that, while we hold it, it forms part of our cash balances, and it'll be managed on an interest rate bearing basis to the extent that we can. I don't think there are contradictory statements there. No, I think that I think they're they're plain statements. We're all accountants now. Fine. Now I've got Chris. Councillor Kettle, did you want to come in? Thank you, uh, thank you Mr Chairman. Uh, I mean, three points. Um, one is um, on page 209, we talk about um, current budgets and adjustments. Is this not now a redundant sheet of paper? Because um, I think some years ago we agreed that once the budget was set, the budget was set, and therefore there should really be no amendments to the budget. Um, because otherwise, what's the point in setting budget? That's point one. Point two is, um, is there any opportunity for further COVID funds to be released to us from central government? Um, because no doubt there will be COVID costs going on. Um, we have no idea what's going to happen this winter. Um, but do you have any, any uh, foresight as to what might happen now? And I think the third point is the um, probably the, the, the bigger one is on page 207. Uh, you've highlighted that expenditure is uh, we've got a per period for variance of, of one million uh, and twenty eight thousand uh, on a budget or at that stage of about ten point eight million for expenditure, which is a 10 percent overrun. Um, what prospect is there of that million pound overrun on expenditure uh, being clawed back over the remaining eight months of the uh, of the year or are we going to see a continual um, run rate in that sort of ilk if we ignore the impact of the um, Blue, uh, the blue bin recycling costs, which clearly are an extraordinary item and one which none of us could have anticipated um, two months ago, four months ago or any other time. Thank you, Councillor Kettle. Councillor Harvey, do you wish to respond to those or is this one for Mr Snow? Uh, I, I, I'll deal with the first one. Now, given that you've got a, um, a piece of paper which uh, one number is repeated three times and there are three and there are two two noughts which are repeated. I suspect Councillor Kettle might be right, but there might be different circumstances where um, which could arise where uh, Mr Snow might say to the contrary, but I will leave questions to the question of whether there's more money likely to come from government for COVID and uh, I'll leave that one to um, uh, Mr Snow. Um, I think there's an explanation on point three that uh, that the 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 forecast is that the current shortfall uh, of, of a million pounds will be carried to the end of the year. That's the expectation of officers, as I understand it. Uh, but uh, Mr. Snow may know different. 
looking at your crystal ball, do you think there will be any more money coming from <laughs> government for COVID? Right, if I could just uh, take those points in turn, thank you. I mean, just going to the first point about the um, the appendix with the repeated uh, budget in it. I mean, yes, I mean, it is, you know, not really showing any great information at the moment, but there is always scope for a supplementary estimate if, you know, if um, circumstances are right and the council are happy for that. And that's in line with the council's um, financial regulations. But obviously, you know, we, you know, if we, unless we've got the funding and got confidence there, we wouldn't be advocating any supplementary budgets. Um, in terms of the COVID um, funding, the one area of funding that we still are expecting some additional income is for the current financial year for the first three months of year of the year in terms of the sort of fees and charges compensation scheme. So a, a claim will have to be made uh, within the next month, I believe, reflecting the first quarter where we can argue that due to, um, you know, the results of COVID that some of our income streams have been specifically hit, noticeably in terms of car park income, and maybe some of the uh, leisure concession, which we we should be getting some of. So we will be putting a claim in for that, which will help. But as, at the moment, obviously, we're not aware of any other further specific or unring fenced income streams coming in respect of COVID. Uh, in terms of the actual sort of forecast position, I mean, yes, we are forecasting a sort of at this stage a sort of million pound shortfall, which, you know, obviously as accountants, we are, ten, you know, do tend to be prudent. Now, I don't think we'd advocate being anything other than that. We obviously a lot of these shortfalls are based on some of the forecast income streams, notably things like car parks and planning income, um, for which, you know, a lot of other factors outside of our con direct control can impact on that. So, you know, hopefully we would see an upturn in some of those. But obviously at the moment, um, you know, this is uh, based on the information we have. This is the best position we, we can present at the moment. Thank you, Mr Snow. Uh, I've got Councillor Cargill, then back to Councillor Kettle, then Councillor Junior. Councillor Cargill. Thank you, Leader. Uh, just one point of clarification, if I may, on 4.1.3 on page 201 which is the information technology showing an unfavorable position of £130,000 as a result of additional cost to implementing the Office 365 license. If you can possibly expand on that, just from my point of view, please. But I would also just make a comment, if I may. Um, the word prudent was just used, and I think it demonstrates the prudent nature of the fiscal management of this council, that we are in this state considering the things that have been thrown at us, which are as mentioned, out of our control. So I, th I just commend the officers uh, for their, their diligence in this and, uh, and, and making sure that we are a viable authority. Thank you, Councillor Cargill. Uh, yes, there has had to be quite a lot of very responsive behaviour on the part of officers, given what's happened in the Council. Councillor Kettle and then Councillor Junit. Um, uh, yes, Mr Snow, thank you for that response. Um, clearly, the comments about income are, are, are very relevant, but actually what I was focusing on was purely the expenditure element, um, where the budget uh, to date was to, and this excludes any housing benefit, of course, um, of 10.8 million, and our variance is uh, just over a million. That is, that excludes any, the impact of any income that might be further down in the, in, on that particular table. Um, so what I asked was that million pound overspend to date, is that something that we would look uh, to claw back over the remaining eight months or is that million pound overspend in four months going to continue with us at that level or is it going to be uh, a continuing uh, increase notwithstanding the issue about the blue bin uh, costs which are outside of this as I previously mentioned. Thank you, Councillor Kettle. Mr. Snell. The uh, right in terms of the um, expenditure variances. Yes, I mean we would be seeking to try to recover that over the rest of the financial year, where services have, um, you know, incurred, um, have effectively overspent. We will try to expect them to cut back where where possible to do that. But um, obviously, as I'm sure you recognise in terms of protecting services, that's not always as 
straightforward as we would like. But yes, we will be trying to hold uh, you know, our budget managers to account. And as we said, those budgets are still the, the agreed budgets are still the budgets and that's what they should still be adhering to keep to. So can I just come back to the Office 365 question as well? Um, yes, I mean, this is a with the change to Office 365, um, the council is now on an, an annual license for the Office 365. Previously, um, bodies such as um, the council would have sort of effectively paid for sort of five year or some other period sort of um, license. Now all these things are on an annual license basis. So and of course, um, yeah, I mean, so there is had to be a budget adjustment to factor that in on an annual cost. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Mr. Buckland, do you want to interject? Yeah, I just wanted to draw members to. Thank you, Mr. Thank Buckland. You, Mr. Buckland. That's very helpful. Councillor Harvey. Uh, to, to emphasise that point, can I just draw attention, particularly Councillor Kettle's attention, to page 206, where the the estimated outturn position for the whole year is uh, put at £943,000, compared with the current position at the end of, of um, Q1 of a million and twenty-seven. million. There's nearly £100,000 uh, indicated in the papers that uh, answers his point or addresses his point that efforts will be made by officers and staff during the year in order to recover as much as possible. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Uh, Councillor Jimmett. Yeah, no, my number one question was about um, the COVID funds and whether they would be uh, whether there would be further government um, funding to cover costs and income, so I, I do hope they, we're kept informed on that. But the second question was about uh, planning enforcement. Um, the Department for the Planning Enforcement had a £75,000 budget cut this year uh, and just wondered whether uh, that it was a, a temporary work basis, whether that was the only department that had that kind of uh, budget cut and whether or not uh, there is any plans to um, uh, reinstate that as we go forward, because planning enforcement is such a, a vital, um, a vital kind of uh, service for the council. Councillor Parry, do you wish to respond on that particular issue? Uh, thank you, leader, and thank you, Councillor Junid. Uh, the budget has was set at seventy-five thousand deficit on against planning and enforcement, which was approved by all councillors in the meeting back in February and at present there are no plans to increase that. Um, the Certainly the enforcement team has been reorganised, it's got a, um, we've got a new structure on that. Um, with regard to the deficit on planning, you'll note in the report it highlights, um, basically we throughout the COVID period, what has happened on the planning in terms of application fees, we've had a we've been, had a flurry of householder type of applications, very small applications that involve a, a high proportion intense officer involvement. But what we haven't had are the large big development um, schemes that, have, that, that normally come through that obviously a, attach a far greater fee with them. Um, the planning team has tried to manage um, and try and balance the variance. We've had a situation where there was a recruitment freeze over the last nine months, I think I'll be right in saying, but currently now we are recruiting and um, you know, getting back to full steam. But it was a situation, I think, through COVID, a lot of people took the opportunity Householders took the opportunity to look to uh, have extensions, um, you know, to have more work, home at work, office space. Um, but these attracted a very small fee, but actually a lot of officer time. Thank you, Leader. Thank you for that clear exposition, Councillor Councillor Parry. 
If I Councilor could just Joe come back, Richard, that, yeah. I, I did ask whether this was the only department that had had that kind of cut. Chairman, uh, the only only team, and um, perhaps you know, maybe you you could update me on that. I asked the question because it did seem to be disputed at a previous meeting that that, that had been voted for by councillors. Right. Uh, so recommendation on page 199. Can I have a proposal, please? Councillor Harvey and Councillor Parry will second. In that case, uh, are Cabinet happy with the recommendation on page 199? Thank you. So moving on, Domestic Abuse Act 2021, uh, introduction and implications, uh, Councillor Barker. Thank you, Leader. Um, I have uh, Nick Cad waiting in the wings um, if necessary, but I'm hoping that I can uh, make a good stab at doing this one, pardon the pun. Um, the Domestic Abuse Act received assent in April 2021 um, and this enhances the provision for victims and survivors of domestic abuse in their families. Um, if you look at the background information, <coughs> we support the infrastructure around reducing the impact of domestic abuse and we're part of all sorts of organisations and risk, uh, risk assessment bodies. Um, we also also there's a domestic abuse section as you as you've seen in the homelessness strategy because that's that is something that is singularly important that people have um, a real fear of fleeing domestic violence because they are more than likely going to become homeless and so that has a disproportionate impact and is something that we're well aware of and we are looking to deliver outreach by refuge. Um, the, the challenges to this are that um, we're looking at more people potentially with the additional vulnerability where we already have um, the duty to accommodate safely, but it doesn't necessarily feel as though it's going to be disproportionate. Um, as our I've seen a, personally a big increase in the number of people who have uh, either suffered or survived or are in the middle of domestic abuse situations to become particularly apparent during COVID. So I think we're all ready for um, needing to do something about it. Um, the allocation we've been given um, across the county is over a million pounds. We've been given 34,000 in this current year, which probably I should jump up and down about and see whether we can get some more money, and I probably will. Um, it, but to start with, it's developing the strategy for safe accommodation, um, and, to, and because we'll be doing it across Warwickshire, there are, um, that will undoubtedly mean that we save money as we do it doing it together. Um, the, there is a financial implication, which I don't normally find in things I do, um, but we will secure greater economy, uh, economies with both um, districts working together as well. Um, just refer you to the strategy itself on page 219 which, onwards, which you may care to spend some time reading, <clears throat> because this is uh, a growing issue and I think probably a lot of us as councillors see. Um, I don't think I can be the only one. So um, having said that, I, the recommendations are that the contents of the report are noted and that the approach, including the safe accommodation strategy, which you can see, um, is supported. Thirdly, in order to gain procurement efficiencies and economies, that the principle that safe accommodation duty funding may be pooled with other Warwickshire authorities 
should be approved and that finally we will sign a memorandum of understanding with the MHCLG that we should agree to that. So I would ask that uh, we agree those recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barker. Councillor O'Donnell. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Barker, just a couple of questions really, and I'm sure um, this, this is this is a welcome addition, isn't it, to the legislation involved in protecting our most vulnerable within our community, and it's it's obviously very nuanced and detailed, which is is welcome. Um, just a couple of questions, and it might be they might be crystal ball questions, but looking at paragraph three or section three, they said there might be a small uplift. Do you have any idea, given insight you have within your ward and reports you may have had from other councillors, what level of small uplift that might be, capacity-wise, what what we might be looking at? Um, and I simply ask that because obviously the 34,000 isn't a huge amount of money and relieved to hear you'll be jumping up and down to get more. Um, what would the timeline be on that? And when we're looking at the challenges ahead, obviously we're looking at a, a talented team of, of officers who are already stretched and we're looking to upskill we're looking to upskill at pace and a tight timeline. How confident are you with regards to the capacity within the teams for this, especially given the extra load involved from a, a mental health perspective of working within this field and the extra strain involved in that? Um, so those are the questions really. And when we talked about um, the money, it's about whether we do think that's actually anywhere in the ballpark of what we will need as an authority to help support our most vulnerable. Um, thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you. Um, as you know, I always jump up and down for more money, uh, only being slightly facetious. I mean, most of that is the is the money, in, in fact, to um, fund the working together um, situation, not necessarily to fund housing itself. We do have, we undoubtedly have some incredible talent. One of them, or two of them, I can't see because my glasses are failing me, are uh, sitting there on teams at the moment. And I have every confidence in them um, actually being able to do this. I think also where we talk about a bit of additional vulnerability, I think we already see a fair amount. And I don't think that the quantity from my own perspective and Nick may want to come in at this point and say something completely different but which I'm teeing him up for there we are Nick if you're oh no oh no Lisa's arrived excellent she's teed up for it um that the strain will not be any more than we were able to take on in the first place but we have a brilliant team and so very confident we'll be able to do it ah uh, Lisa and Nick go on do you want to challenge me now not, not I've been too optimistic. Can I just not, frame not that? I think the, the question was whether you'll need more resourcing on it, because it is obviously, yeah, that, that's that's the brunt of the question is given the small uplift that we might see in numbers, given the fact that it's a far more extensive definition now around domestic abuse, will you as a team need more resources in order to deal with this? Or do you think it's simply that it's a change in, in terminology and actually you're going to be okay? I think uh, uh, through you, through you, Chair, if that's if that's OK. Um, I think it's a really good challenge and a very pertinent question that, that you ask um, and something that Nick and I are looking at in terms of the resources that we need to deliver the service going forward. However, our early um, indications would suggest that we've probably got sufficient staffing. Um, Obviously, we've trained the staff in terms of the, the new approach that's required um, and um, and we will be monitoring the situation to see if there is any impact on, on staffing and then we'll we'll act accordingly. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. That was a very clear response. So thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, can I just be my usual pedantic self and uh, refer to first leg of the recommendation and the word is should be an R because we're talking about contents. Um, second, more, somebody somebody could highlight my or enlighten my ignorance. The contents of this report are noted. It's the contents that are being noted, not the report. It's an R. 
I'll move on. Bye. <laughs> Five five point five point two. Um, could I be told what a perpetrator service is? I have no idea what a perpetrator service is. That's highlighting my ignorance. But more to the substance, um, it, it it follows on from Councillor O'Dowell's point. Really, um, on page two two six, there are some numbers, um, interesting numbers, estimated cases of twenty three thousand five hundred cases. Um, across Warwickshire um, in relation to domestic abuse. And yet, um, on page 231, uh, the amounts of money that are allocated to town and borough councils is much the same. Uh, what I would like to know is um, the, dis the distribution of that 23,500 cases uh, across the county by, by borough or district not simply by county because I need it, it follows up the point have we got sufficient resource um, and uh, if if we have a disproportionate level of abuse then we should be arguing clearly for far more if on the other hand uh, other boroughs and councils have got disproportionate uh, levels of abuse then we would expect them to be arguing for their for their cause so I, I'm trying to get a feel as to whether somebody has actually just divvied this uh, number up and given everybody 34k on the grounds of, of very little evidence or if there is evidence that supports these numbers what is that evidence and I don't, I don't expect a detailed answer today but I would value um, a considered response in due course. Uh, Councillor Junid but just to say that I think that may well be something that needs to be taken away and responded to uh, when all the data is available. Councillor Junid. It, it is it is welcome um, that this act is now uh, in in law. Uh, we have, I think, all of us noted. I certainly have noted that there has been a rise in domestic abuse over this last year or two. Uh, um, but what I particularly want to emphasise is that in many cases there are children involved as well. So I'm just wondering um, whether um, you know how how that is is it taken on, on board. In some cases that I've dealt with, um, the domestic abuse uh, has happened. It's been emotional or physical, uh, and the, the person has not wanted to leave the home because it would take a roof away from their children. But those children are then going to be suffering, um, you know, poor circumstances and, and in trauma, etc. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether thirty-four thousand doesn't sound an awful lot to help. Mm -hmm. Um, the, 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 the people concerned, but also the family and the children in, that are concerned, particularly when therapy has to be considered. <laughs> Councillor Barker. <clears throat> Again, um, Lisa or Nick may wish to come in on this, but if you just have a look at page 230, um, the sort of wrap around care, for want of a better word, um, to go with this includes support for children and so on. If you look at the amount that the County Council has, a lot of the work that is done statut statutorily is what they is what the County Council does. And that's therefore why the big pot of money is there. I couldn't possibly comment on the divvying up of 34 grand ish, but it's the pump priming for getting the for getting everybody trained up who we've already got is my understanding and Nick's nodding which is good so I've understood it. Okay thank you so if there are no more questions or comments from members of the cabinet. I think Lisa was waving on, yes, on the no. telly. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> thank you okay, Councillor Barker. I, I just wanted to make the point that the the funding allocation is um, is from MHCLG and they they will have based it on uh, most likely on on homeless statistics that every local authority is obliged to provide um, to them. So this is a national allocation, um, and and it's it's you know it's quite likely that um, <clears throat> that they've got a very uh, very clear funding funding mechanism. But we can ask our our local advisors for the for, for the detail of that if they uh, if they have that um if they have that to hand 
and 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 councillor barker is quite correct in that on on such a a complex issue as domestic abuse we're required to work very closely with our <clears throat> with our other statutory and voluntary sector partners to try and um broker those the, the, uh, uh, and, and and get a, a bespoke wraparound service for for each of the um of the households that do approach us for for assistance and we do know that it takes um a person um a, a substantial amount of time to to approach um local authorities for for that help and of course um as being a housing authority our role in that is securing either that the existing home is safe for them and that might be putting in some um, uh, sanctuary or target hardening works to enable them to stay in their existing home which can be better for the children who've got established networks schools health visitors and so forth or alternatively to find uh, alternative accommodation either in the district or very often in other districts and that sort of shows the length to which sometimes people uh, have to go to 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 escape a, uh, an abusive or or um, or kind of um, uh, partner that, that will will find them where you know try and find them wherever they are. So I think this is this kind of this strategy begins to draw those those different aspects together. Um, but thank you for the questions. We'll certainly Nick, Nick and I will certainly go away uh, and, and bring back a, a response to those. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, very clear exposition. So we've got a very complex issue and this is just the start of a process and development of the approach. So with that, recommendations on page 213. Uh, can I have a proposal, please? Councillor Barker, a seconder. Councillor Cargill, uh, can I have your agreement to the recommendations on page 213, please, members of Cabinet? Agreed. Thank you. So moving on, uh, there is nothing under part C or part D. Part E are on block items and these are going to be approved on block and no request has been made for the item to be discussed. So can I have your agreement to the on block items, please? I'll take that as yes. And there be no matters of urgent business. I declare the meeting closed at what I think is five 18. Thank you, everyone.